On this episode of This Week in Space, it's high time we all figured out what people think about space exploration and why some don't seem to think about it at all. We're joined by Roger Lanius, former NASA and Smithsonian Institution space historian. Stay with us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 93, recorded on January 12th, 2024. Does America really want to go back to the moon? This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Rocket Money. If I asked you how many subscriptions you have, would you be able to list all of them and how much you're paying? If you would have asked me this question before I started using Rocket Money, I would have said yes, but let me tell you, I would have been so wrong. Our friend Leo made what he thought was a one-time political contribution that turned out to be a recurring political contribution he'd forgotten all about, and Rocket Money got him off the hook. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. Rocket Money has more than 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 per year with more than $500 million in canceled subscriptions. You can see all of your subscriptions in one place. And if you see something you don't want, you can cancel it with a tap. You never have to get on the phone with customer service. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash twists. That's rocketmoney.com slash twists. Rocketmoney.com slash twists. Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the Why We Go edition. I'm Rod Pyle. Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, it's my enduring pleasure to be joined, as always, by the illuminating Tarek Malik, Editor-in-Chief of Space.com. Hello, 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 Rod. How's it, how's it going? Happy Friday. Happy, uh, happy podcast day. You're not only illuminating, you're uplifting. And today, <laughs> in a few moments, we're going to be joined by Roger Lanius, who is the former Chief NASA Historian, former Associate Director for Collections and Curatorial Affairs of the Smithsonian, a deep seeker of the truth about many things, spaceflight, including what the heck people really think about spaceflight in the U.S., which is a thornier topic than you might think. Uh, a couple of housekeeping memos before we get rolling. First, Twit needs your help. We want to keep our show in the air and Twit available to all, so you can help for just $7 a month by joining Club Twit. I'll give the usual plea at the end of the episode, but please consider it. It would help us all, and we know you love us because we get your fan mail. Second up, it's survey time. The annual Twit survey helps keep us informed of audience wants and thoughts and helps us to make your listening experience better and better, despite my lame dad space jokes. So go to twit, twit TV slash survey 24. That's T-W-I-T TV slash survey 24. It will only take you a few minutes. Last day to do the survey is January 31st. So don't be a lollygagger. Make sure you get... Uh, Get your opinions in early and often. Now you can only do it once. Speaking of bad dad space jokes. Your jokes are the best, Rod. They're not well, bad at all. This isn't mine, thank God. <laughs> More from our pal Tucker Drake, who wrote to remind me that the credit or blame, as the case may be, for the jokes that we're getting from him should go to the book 101 Outer Space Jokes, unquote, written by Will Eisner. It was a Ooh. classic humorist, so the blame goes there. we got to look for that book. Uh, well, yeah, all we have to do is keep talking to Tucker, thank God, there you go. <laughs> who has his own podcast. I think it's, oh God, I had it written down, The Lonely Trailer Park or something. I'll have to get it into another. But uh, Tucker Drake, look it up under Tucker Drake under podcasts. All right. Hey, Tarek. Yes, Rod. Asteroid hotel guest got on the space phone and said, hello, get me the manager. Manager said, manager speaking, how can I help you? Guest, what kind of rundown place are you running here? I'm mad enough to report this place to the Interstellar Health Patrol. Manager, calm down and tell me what's eating you. Hotel guest, I don't know, but you better send someone up here quick to kill it. <laughs> okay. Well, as always, we invite you to join Rod's Rangers and send us your best or worst space joke. I'm just going to do one this week because we, we got a lot to cover here. Yeah. And please don't forget to do us a solid and make sure to like, subscribe, and all that cool podcast stuff and give us five thumbs up or 20 or whatever you can because it's free and we, we love you. And we don't want to come over and blow out your airplane hatches 
Oh, I'm sorry. Was that a Boeing joke? I didn't mean to do that, Tark. <laughs> oh, All right. Let's go. Wow, Let's go to headlines. Too soon. Too soon. <laughs> well, come on, guys. You've been building airplanes a long time. Just bolt down the hatch properly. Speaking of things Boeing, good news. Um, yes. ULA, which is a partnership between Boeing and Lockheed Martin, launched United Launch their- Alliance. Their United Launch Alliance launched their Vulcan rocket, their long anticipated, long anticipated Vulcan rocket, but it worked, which is, you know, that's how ULA rolls. Takes longer, costs more money, works every time and has basically since they redesigned the Atlas from an ICBM into their workhorse of 20, some 25 years. And now they have the Vulcan, which is their new rocket with engines from Blue Origin. Tell us what you think. Yeah, I have I have uh, my own Vulcan rocket. As yeah, where's well. mine? By the way, you got that so, from them. I'm I'm thinking, I, right? I did. Yeah, United Launch Alliance. Actually, they sent me this. It's like a two for folks who can't see it. It's a two foot model of of oh my gosh of of the uh, of the of Falling the Vulcan rocket and it's six side boosters. But unfortunately, when it arrived, all six of the strap on boosters had broken off. So I actually spent the weekend before the launch gluing them on okay like, okay, okay super glue yeah, okay okay but, nice. but, we got a headline here but, and what i really want to know is where's mine i'm sure well, you know. mentioned them <laughs> your good friend and co-host I, you know i'll put i'll put well we invited them on the show so hopefully they'll come on to tell us about this amazing launch which i'm going to talk about right now because as this week started ula began it with the bang uh the united launch alliance with their their uh, first ever Vulcan Centaur rocket. This will be uh, uh, ULA's new workhorse rocket to replace the Atlas V when they retire. Uh, there are not very many uh, flights of that uh, in the the next like five years or so, and so. And they've sold a lot of a lot of flights on this. And, you know, it's the first launch of a rocket. We've already seen SpaceX launch a brand new rocket twice, and it didn't make it to space. So you always expect maybe things aren't going to go that great it has been and this was delayed from christmas eve too uh and their initial attempts to to launch it and uh and it was a a stunning success the launch part of it uh this was um they they launched it with two different uh with two solid rocket boosters and the the twin be4 engines built by boeing which they had or pardon me by blue Blue origin Origin. by blue origin and blue origin had a lot of problems with this this engine getting it to ula for this rocket so kind of like a two for here you get the unqualified success of the launch part of this mission uh which says that ula's uh new rocket seems like it's ready to go i mean it it, it seemed spotless a flawless countdown flawless launch and it looked absolutely gorgeous with this pre-dawn launch um and then you have the first orbital launches of the be4 engine for blue origin which wants to put like a half dozen of these things at the bottom end of their new new glenn rocket which this week they rolled out to the launch pad for some tests uh the first stage of that uh they they, they know now that that engine will get all the way to space with a full burn so uh really just a spectacular to watch i was so impressed at how smooth it was but there was kind of a flip side the payload on this uh, and this is our second story. Both both these stories, by the way, you can find them at space.com, but they were widely covered. The second the second story from this launch is that the first payload on this rocket was this private moon lander called Peregrine, uh, built by Astrobotic. They're they're based in Pittsburgh. And it's separated, you know, uh, and was deployed in its nominal orbit uh on time. So ULA's job was done. And unfortunately, this this mission, which is NASA's first commercial lunar payload services mission. It's their first partnership to try to get NASA payloads to the moon on a private lander. Uh, it developed a leak in its propulsion system. It is limping through space right now. It will not be able to land on the moon. So it's a bit of a kind of a sad ending for what was a glorious launch. And um, and so uh, every day this week, as we're, we're recording this, this, uh, this kind of hardy lander has been fighting for its life. It's about 94% of the way to the moon, uh, but it will not be able to land there uh, uh, next month as, as scheduled, which is kind of sad. Well, that's a bummer. Um, speaking of malfunctioning space hardware, yeah. uh, we have been watching the OSIRIS-REx return capsule for months scratching our heads over what does it take to to lever open something that's stuck <laughs> because of some spring some errant springs and catch mechanisms but uh according 
according to you, they finally got it open. How'd that's they right. It? Well, they, they got it unlocked. And I think that's the key part here. I think mm. the, NASA might want to make a little bit of a of a big deal out of um uh, out of the opening itself. But as, as you mentioned, you know, the, the OSIRIS-REx uh, sample return capsule from asteroid Bennu uh, returned to Earth in September, like late September. And NASA has had it. Uh, in its its kind of receiving facility at the Johnson Space Center, Astro Materials uh, uh, Center, uh, what since about well since then basically it arrived in early uh, uh, late late September early um, October is when they debuted it to everybody, uh, and they had all the samples we talked about it before of asteroid Bennu on top like of the capsule itself like it was it didn't make it all the way in it was already bolted shut, mm. but it has these thirty five fasteners on the top of the lid that keep it closed. And they were only able to get 33 of them off and two of them were jammed stuck. So for the last like four or five months, it's been, they haven't been able to open the thing <laughs> to, 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 to know that that, and that's where all the samples are. The, the coffee cup full of, of samples, the most ever returned by a mission uh, are there in that thing. And, uh, and so now as of this week, it happened on January 10th, they did, built these special tools to try to pry open these fasteners and they got both of them out. So now they're all ready uh, to, to start opening the lid and getting to the, the bottom of these, um, uh, uh, the sample container. And I mean, there's a lot of material in there. You know, we heard it on, on the yeah. show before uh, that they're really, they're going to be like digging into this stuff for a long time. Yeah, it's it's like a cup or more, right? Yeah, yeah, and and they had to build like a whole new tool, like a special tool, to be able to pry this thing open. Uh, it really looks weird the way that they were able to do it. It's like a ring that goes around it, and then like the the, the tool itself goes through like a hatch to, to get to the fastener. I, it, it's rocket science to me, but they were able to make it work and not ruin their samples uh, or contaminate them, which was the big thing. They want these samples as pristine as the day they were collected billions of miles away by the um, the Osiris record. A millions of miles away by the Osiris spacecraft, and um, seems like they they got that job done. All right, uh, and before we uh, jump to our break, I just need to re I remind myself to remind you that if you do tune over to Tucker Drake's podcast, there's a little R-rated language there, so it isn't family friendly friendly like ours. Uh, it's a, a, a stream of consciousness sort of thing with some language that will curl some people's toes. So just <laughs> consider yourself forewarned. All right. We will be right back after this short break with our guest for today, NASA space historian, Roger Lanius. Stay with us. All right, Roger, again, thank you so much for joining us. It's a real pleasure having you here. It's something I've wanted to do for a long time. And I think even longer than that, I've been bugging you to try and get an article out of you, but that's a whole separate conversation because <laughs> that's a big ask at the rates that we pay. But, um, it's great to have you here. And and I at the open of the show, I gave a very brief sort of nod to your resume. But let's take a slightly deeper look because I have a question that relates to this. So currently principal of Alanius Historical Services. Right. Formerly it's Smithsonian Institution. Uh, you left there, at, I believe, as Associate Director for Collections and Curatorial Affairs. That's correct. Which is a heck of a title. It's uh, a mouthful. That, before that, you were the chair of the Division of Space History. And before that, uh, did you just have two positions there or three? Well, I was a, first I was I was a curator. Um, you know, my career path, I spent 35 years working for the feds as a historian, U.S. government. And um, that sounds very black hat when you say it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's whatever. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and I worked for the Air Force for a while, and uh, and then after eight years, uh, moved to NASA as the chief historian. Spent 12 years there, all through the 1990s and into the 2000s. And then after that, I moved over to the Smithsonian, first as a curator, then as the chair of that space history department. There's about 15 or 16 people who do space history there. And, um, and then after I rotated out of that chair job and it's a it's a rotation of after five years mm. uh, i moved to a senior curator position and then i was tapped in my last uh, few years there as the associate director which you've already mentioned well so for those of us who are often labeled as space historians although I don't call myself that and and 
for a lot of, I can only speak for me. I don't want to besmirch anybody else. I kind of feel like I'm, you know, nibbling around the crumbs on the floor of the hallowed halls of places like the Smithsonian and NASA headquarters and so forth. Um, how does one become a quote, real space historian, unquote, because <laughs> I backed into it through, through short, you know, television, like 44 minute documentaries yeah, that's sure. where the history channel said, tell us the whole history of Apollo in 44 minutes. And I'm thinking, that's yeah, like good luck with that. Yeah. Well, they, and it ends up being horrible. So that's not the way to do it. But I was lucky enough to get into books after that, where they kind of leave you alone, let you do your thing, but you've made a real career out of it in a very disciplined way probably almost always peer reviewed way. So how does that happen and what's it like? Yeah, well, I mean, I did a PhD in history, American history at LSU. Uh, and uh, I never studied space history at all, or any kind of aerospace for that matter. I was a right. historian of the American West. Oh. And, um, and my interest at that point, which is still one of my interests, I still work in this area, was the history of Mormonism. And uh, most of us are familiar with Mormonism and, and, and some form or another. And I was doing religious history on the American West. That's, that's what I was focused on. But when I went looking for a job, there's not a lot of room for, for Mormon historians out there. Uh, and uh, I found this job with the Air Force. And I realized very quickly that this, that this flying stuff was really interesting. At that point, I, uh, it, it wasn't space. Uh, it was about airplanes but uh you know one time i the, the person who hired me i asked him one day after i hadn't been there but more than about a month or so and i said why did you hire me i don't have any background in this field and he says i don't care about that what i care about is do you have the skills to research write present orally and in writing uh historical analysis and you clearly have that I can teach you the, the particular subject matter that we're talking about, aviation. And he put me on a reading list and he says, here, read these 10 books, come back and talk to me about them. <laughs> and we did that for months. Uh, and so I learned aviation history through that process, never had a class in it anywhere. Uh, the same was true with space. I literally, I saw a job in the year 1990, the spring of 1990, that NASA was looking for the chief historian. And I thought, well, that might be fun. <laughs> so I applied. And this is the days before the internet. You didn't, you know, send in a resume through some system. You literally copied a, uh, your, your resume and you sent it into them. And lo and behold, I got an interview and, uh, and they hired me for this particular position. And that was a, a great opportunity and at that point i decided i better become a space historian so i <laughs> so i did the same thing there i started working on a reading list to to learn the subject matter everything i could about it i was especially interested in the policy world that was one of the areas that i had focused on when i when i worked for the air force and uh, i still think that's one of the really important areas it needs to be focused on there were other people doing you know, things about how rockets work and how much thrust they have and all that kind of stuff. None of that really interested me all that much. So uh, I didn't focus on it, but uh, I, I did sort of through this process, long and involved, years in the making. I've, I've spent 35 plus years now working in aerospace history as my day job. Mm -hmm. And um, and I guess if that's how you earn your chops, at least that's how I did it. I can only guess, Roger, if I'm a NASA recruiter seeing 12 years at the Air Force, uh, you know, doesn't look too shabby on an application. So. No, 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 no. I mean, you know, the, the, the Air Force and, and, and NASA has a longstanding relationship. No question about yeah. that. And uh, and it was viewed as a plus that I had been there. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, when you when you think about the chief historians for NASA, the very first one uh was hired out of the air force history program and the air force has a huge history program uh more than 250 civilian historians scattered literally all over the world yeah. and wow. that many more who are military working in all kinds of areas everything from the air force academy to the various other uh organizations that do research 
uh, for the Air Force to unit historians who are assigned to a particular base doing things associated with, with those activities. Well, How many I, does I, NASA have? NASA has a smaller group, obviously, and so much smaller <laughs> organization. Uh, but uh, when I arrived at NASA in 1990, uh, there were uh, six people uh, in the in the uh, uh, history office for the agency at headquarters, and there were historians, or sometimes they were archivists more than they were historians at the various centers. And uh, we tried to plus that up as much as we could, had some successes, some not successes, but uh, but it has also a very strong and robust history program done in a different way than the Air Force did. The Air Force would hire people, get them the clearances that they need and have them work directly for the Air Force. The, the, uh, the NASA program is built on contractors uh, who are as often as not academics who are working at some university who uh, come on to work on a particular project. And we've had a lot of people over the years who've done that kind of work uh, at NASA and are still doing it today. I had a, a, a basic question that I, I ask a lot of our, our guests, Roger, about um, that, that, that seed or that kind of led you on the path that, that, you know, that you're on now. And you mentioned that you were like super into the, you know, like Western history and, and or Mormonism. I'm, I'm very curious, where that began was that something that that started uh, in 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 um, in university or or before, but also just as I guess I, I would be remiss to ask if you had any exposure to space prior to school, like Rod and I both have like these like childhood connections to it. <laughs> um, if there was anything like that that um, that caught your eye, that as you looked back, uh, you know, while you were at NASA and and beyond. Or like, wow, you know, I didn't think I'd be here, that kind of a thing. Well, yeah, of course that happens. Um, you know, when I was a kid, uh, and I'm old enough to remember the moon landing. Um, so, you know, hey, yeah, I mean, there's, there's fewer and fewer of us, quite frankly, that are in that category. <laughs> yes, <true>. But, <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, I was an early teenager. Uh, when the moon landings took place, and I was jazzed by this stuff. There's no doubt about it. I figured out pretty early on that I could write letters to the various NASA centers and ask them for information about their programs, and they would send a package of materials back to me. <laughs> I did this over and over and over again. They'd send mission patches and and uh, yeah, you know, and information sheets and you know, sometimes little booklets, all kinds of stuff. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't keep any of that stuff, which oh. I wish I had now. Oh. But, I was just going to ask you about your eBay site. Okay. Yeah, well, no, I no, I just, Sorry. you know, when I went off to college, I left it at home and my mother immediately threw it all out. Yes. But Gotta love them. Just like she did with my baseball cards, which I still haven't forgiven oh. her for. Oh, no. <laughs> That's worth a little more, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 clearly there's there's oh. a lot a lot going on there. But, um, but she didn't say stuff in the closet so she got rid of it but um but yeah so i was jazzed by this all through the 1960s and 70s and um when i went off to college then in the early night i i i, I graduated from high school in 72 immediately went on to college and um uh, and i was interested in as i said before mormon history i i have a heritage in that movement and um, and consequently, it's a it's an area that's of special interest to me, and it has been all along. I've written several books that relate to this. My dissertation, both my master's thesis and my dissertation, were turned into books. They were both about Mormon history, and uh, and I've done other things associated with that over the years. Um, but once I started working for first for the Air Force and then at NASA, I really started focusing more and more on that particular arena. Mm -hmm. And I've been there most of the time since. Now I've done some other stuff too. I I did two books on the history of baseball because I'm very interested in that. In fact, you can see Stan Musial behind me here. Uh, and um, the uh, uh, and and I've done some 19th century military history, which I also uh, found quite interesting. So, you know, I no one thing is my uh, uh, is is the only thing that I do. But 
I have several interests, but clearly aerospace and especially space has been the dominant thing. Yeah, that's great advice for everybody. <laughs> not not well, one thing, but <laughs> some someday we'll have to share my collection of eighteen seventies and eighteen eighties uh, British British military rifles. But that's a whole nother. Yeah, thing. I love to I'm see like learning that. new things. I, I saw. Do you remember as a kid? Did you see the movie Zulu? We're about the same age. I graduated high school in seventy four. So you remember seeing yeah. Zulu on? TV oh yeah, I, I saw it when it first came out, and we've watched it periodically since that time. So, I never I never get tired of wa watching Michael Caine. Well, exactly. It is first role, right? Yeah, first first major role. And the right. fact that they actually, uh, uh, the lead actor, Stanley, oh, good Lord, Stanley Baker, was that his name? Yeah, Stanley that, Baker, yeah. that's right. So he, he was the creative force behind that movie. He put right. it together. He found the money, all that. And the fact that they showed respect for the people of the other side right, right. in 1964 was uncanny. But that's not what we're here to talk about. So I have a burning <laughs> question. Because of the stuff I've read of yours, mostly on, on academia.com, because unlike Tark's publication, <clears throat> mine can't afford the good databases, but we do see a lot of good stuff on academia. You've written a lot about, and I think this puts you in a, in a very small group of people, very small. You've written a lot about public perceptions about the space race. Yeah. You've written about support for the space race over the decades. So this is kind of a multi-part question. I'm doing what space.com always does around those NASA telecoms. They say, okay, you only get one question. And then guys <laughs> like Tarek said, I have one question with three parts. So the, the three part question is you've obviously studied this at length. There is this overriding perception and some really smart people I know still believe this. And I constantly disabuse them of the notion that there was this golden fuzzy period back in the 1960s when the nation was united behind Apollo and we were all in it for the good fight and all for one and one for all and all that. And that wasn't the case, as you and I remember. You know, we were, but the country was kind of, eh. and what I find really astonishing is that, and I know polling instruments change, polling institutions change, the audience that you're polling changes a lot. But at least in the U.S., it seems like public perceptions of the big questions, like do you support NASA, should the, should the U.S. be a leader in space, that kind of stuff, has been pretty remarkably consistent for 16 oh, yeah. years. Right. But if you ask people about landing on the moon, for instance, today, only about 12 to 15 percent say that's a good idea. So could you comment on that great big thorny question I just tossed at you? Yeah, sure. So one of the things that happened almost as soon as I got at NASA was people people around the agency saying, you know, if we just had the public support that we had during NASA, all would be well. And and I began then looking at these polls and there's lots of polls over yeah. time that, that sort of ask the same question. Uh, and so I could sort of run a uh, an analysis of the same question asked in 1965 and 1966 and 67, 68, and so on. And um, one of the things that we found over and over and over again was when you ask the question, do you approve of Apollo, for instance, at that particular time, you get an overwhelmingly positive response, uh, which is sort of like saying, do you like NASA? And right. generally speaking, people say, yeah, we like NASA. When you when you ask the question, are we spending too much money on this Apollo program? What you get is, oh yeah, we're spending way too much money. And, uh, and it's always the characterization of the NASA program against the backdrop of the, of the money being expended to do it that leads people to say, oh, I don't think we should do this kind of stuff. That then led me into other areas where I was looking to say, okay, so what what was happening in the 1960s. And one of the things that we find is that on both the political left and the political right, um, people are, are saying, yeah, we shouldn't be doing this. We should take this money and do something else more worthwhile with it. If you're on the political right, maybe you want to put it into national defense. Maybe you want to give it back to the American public as a tax break. Uh, if you're, if you're on the political left, you're saying, you know, God, we need to, we need to, to feed the starving people and and uh, and house the homeless and and do all these other kind of social kinds of things that are all important. All of them are important. Uh, and we could better spend our money doing that rather than uh, put people on the moon or choose the program of your choice. 
uh, that NASA is engaged in. And, and that I found fascinating because clearly we didn't have a consensus that this was the right thing to do. But we had enough people sort of in the middle supporting this that we did it. So that leads to the next question. Why did we do it? And I would contend, and I don't think there's any way around this, uh, that we did it because of the Cold War con uh, context in which it was carried out. And, and absent that Cold War context, we never would have undertaken it. So uh, that was sort of where I was coming from with this polling. And one of the things that we found all the time since that time is, is people stand up and say, we like NASA. We, we we think it's we think it's cool, uh, but we don't want to pay for it. Right. <laughs> and, and whatever there is that's out there that uh, we could spend our money on, we want to spend it on that instead of NASA. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, as soon as the moon program is over, the NASA budget drops to about one half of one percent of the federal budget, it's a little right. lower than that today. Um, but, but it's right around there, and it's been there since the mid-1970s. And yet and, a lot of people don't realize, I mean, you see these polls, and it's gotten better over the last decade, but I remember at one point reading something about, you know, some percentage of the American public thinking that NASA was grinding up 25% of the federal yeah, budget. It's like, yeah. whoa, where did you get that idea? Well, there, there's actually some polling to say that. There was a Rockwell poll done in the late 1990s, maybe they've done them since, um, but it asked that question, you know, how much money goes to NASA? And overwhelmingly 25, 30% of the, of the of federal dollars are going there. I mean, anybody who looks at the federal budget knows that that's not true, but right. most people pay, don't pay a lot of attention to that kind of stuff. That's right, because we know that that money went for the F thirty five program. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. That's, um, <laughs> well, there, there, there's a, there's a jab. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Stay okay. away from the F thirty five. My sister worked on that plane. Yeah, but, yeah. Okay. You know she listens to the show. <laughs> we got to take a quick break. So stay with us. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with my next burning question. Okay, so I don't know if you've written about this. If so, I haven't seen it. But and I'm not sure it's a question that can be answered. But in your opinion, was part of the reason Apollo was able to soldier on through the early 1970s, even though there was political opposition on both sides of the aisle, because we had a martyred president thing going on here? I mean, it seemed to me, Kennedy having made this bold declaration, which is a speech I still think is remarkable, uh, you know, if it's 1967 and you're, was it Walter Mondale who was saying, you know, why are we doing this and so forth? That's a pretty hot, hot potato to be thrown in somebody's lap uh, after what happened. Yeah. What's your opinion there? Well, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting because the the decision in 1961 uh, leading to the May 25th, 61 speech by Kennedy to the joint session of Congress the urgent national needs speech in which he says, I choose to go to the moon. Well, actually, yes, he said that in 62. I believe this nation should commit itself before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. <laughs> By the way, Buzz Aldrin told me one time, he says, the favorite part of it, his favorite part of that speech was returning him <laughs> safely to the earth. <laughs> right. yeah. Buzz being a wit uh, went right there. The, um, but within about 10 days of him giving that speech. Uh, the budget director, David Bell, has gone and went into the Oval Office and told the president, you know, NASA is going to break the bank doing this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what can we do about this? And, uh, and Kennedy was a little flabbergasted at that because he said twice during that speech, once was written into the speech and another time he ad-libbed. You know, he says, I... I believe we should do this, but it's going to cost a lot of money. And if you don't agree, tell me now <laughs> and let's not even start. Right. And, and that, those were wise words. And as I said, he said it twice, once in the text of the speech and once in an ad lib uh, that he just said at, this, at the speech. And, um, and he was right about that. But 
when the budget director says, wow, you know, this is gonna, this is gonna be incredible in terms of the costs involved, Kennedy then went to his one and only summit with Khrushchev in early June of 1961 and suggest to him that they turn this moon landing program into a joint effort. Right. And, um, and that was in response to this, to this concern about the budget. Uh, and the initial Khrushchev response was, well, you know, something to think about. Let's, let's talk about it some more. Then they all, they go back to their quarters that after that first meeting and the hardliners get to Kennedy on the American side and the hardliners on the Soviet side get to Khrushchev and they come back the next day and Khrushchev says, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting idea, but it really needs to wait until we get some arms control limitation underway and a, and a, a nuclear test ban treaty and some other stuff that needs to come first. And so they dropped it. But Kennedy came back to this over and over and over again throughout his administration with the intention of trying to turn Apollo into a joint program. And it was fundamentally a way to, uh, to save money. Um, in 1963, then, this is before his assassination, uh, Kennedy calls the NASA administrator, Jim Webb, into, his, into the Oval Office and says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go give a speech at the UN in which I'm going to propose that we turn Apollo into a joint program. And, and, he, and he basically said, and I don't want your advice on this. I've already <laughs> made my decision. Uh, I want you to keep your guys in line. Oh. You know, I don't want Von Braun and I don't want any of these other guys who are out there, any of the astronauts saying this is a dumb idea. Keep them under control. And uh, and he does indeed then in September uh, go to the UN, give this speech about doing the big things together, talking about Apollo. Uh, Sergei Khrushchev, the son of the premier, the Soviet premier, who was working in the Russian Design Bureau, Korolev's design bureau in, 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 in Russia at the time, uh, said he got a call and uh, to come to the Kremlin. And his dad wanted to talk to him about this, this proposal wow. and ask him what he thought. And he said, well, you know, there's a couple of things that are good about it. One is we can save some money because <laughs> they, were, <laughs> they were spending themselves uh, into bankruptcy as well. And... Um, and, uh, and, and oh, by the way, there's, a, there's a, at least a tip of the hat to the capabilities that we have demonstrated in space that mm -hmm. we're on a par with the Americans. And, you know, we'll be better with them by our side than working against them. And, uh, and that seemed to have persuaded uh, Khrushchev to kind of pursue this, but then Kennedy's assassinated in November. Uh, Khrushchev is deposed the next year, and nothing happens. But I would contend that had Kennedy remained in office, uh, there probably would have been a way to sort of reduce the costs involved. Not that they would ever not do the program, but mm. it would have been so easy in 1965, 66, as the Gemini program is, is showing astounding success. Yeah. Uh, for the president to say, you know, we don't need to do this on the clock for, by the end of the decade. Let us take a more leisurely approach to this and spend money. And if we don't, if we don't arrive at the moon by until 1975, so what? Why is that a problem? Mm. Uh, and that might have been what happened. And or they might have turned it into a joint program, which would be fascinating. Now the military. And the technical people associated with national security would would not like that one little bit because uh, that would be giving the Russians some some knowledge of our of our technical capabilities. Right. And oh, by the way, the Russians would feel the same way about them giving the Americans that knowledge of their technical capabilities as well. So it, none of that happened. Uh, but I I think that Kennedy's death you can't say with a certainty. Kennedy's death was uh, a, a boon for the program. And literally, Jim Webb, the NASA administrator, pulled it like a gun 
whenever somebody tried to cut the NASA budget on this, he says, are you, are you mean, do you mean to tell me that you don't want, not want to complete the dying wish of our slain president? Wow. It wasn't his dying <laughs> wish, and, <laughs> but that doesn't matter. Politically, it was a good argument, and he used it all the time. Well, and that's particularly interesting because I recall Kennedy was uh, behind this for geopolitical reasons, but certainly yeah. not for reasons of exploration and science. Yeah. Now, if I do remember correctly, though, even though the cooperation on the human space flight side died rather quickly, um, on the robotic space flight side, there actually was some progress towards the mid to late 1960s of sharing, at least sharing information and some right. technical data. Is that right? Yeah. Now, I mean, very early on, they, they made uh, deals to, to share uh, uh, data sets of what they found there. There was also a, a joint effort to do uh, uh, some satellite capabilities together, mostly just talking to the satellites without any difficulty. Mm -hmm. um, there, were, there were other joint efforts tried. There was a lot of support for those at the working level. Uh, and if they could do it sort of under the radar, they always did it. Uh, but if it rose to the level where national leaders were involved, then usually it didn't happen. You know, it's, it's interesting, Roger, the, the case you made about how much you know, the whole moon program was going to cost there in, in, in the speech, because I, I recall uh, in 2004, seeing, you know, a new moon speech uh, from uh, then NASA Administrator Michael Griffin talking about what was then the Constellation program uh, and very clearly laying out that it was going to be, you know, X amount of years and we're going to build these rockets and it's going to cost a hundred billion dollars. I mean, that was like, like laid out there that that's how much it was going to cost and that if we don't have the hundred billion dollars, then we're not going to make it to the moon. And then lo and behold, that money never gets passed uh, through uh, through the powers that be with uh, with Kennedy or uh, with uh, Congress, uh, and and in 2011, everyone is surprised that, that the space shuttles are are retiring and that there is no uh, space no follow There's no right. follow up. There's nothing, and not only is there nothing, but there's. <laughs> There's a the Augustine Commission that says, oh, you could go to the moon, but you can't land on it. Or you could build a lander, but not go to the moon because of all of the stuff that never got passed with the budget and everything. And it it brings to mind that it's 2024 now. And and I'm sorry, it's a very long winded question. <laughs> and, and, and it is, of course, um, a, a presidential election. And you just made a, a really strong point about that that tie between presidential directions and achievements with with the national program like like nasa and of course nasa administrators are appointed um by by the presidents and i guess the the the, the question that i I'm, I'm kind of dancing around is is there a difference between the longevity of goals in the u.s space program now because of that political affiliation uh that is different than what we saw during the the apollo era where you had this kind of multi-administration not through choice right because there was an assassination uh uh uh, uh th through line where you had that continuity that was able to achieve you know three three different uh, crew vehicles in 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 a decade you know a lunar landing that, that that was followed up you know within the the same year that kind of a thing because things they take forever we just watched the sls launch it took how long rod how long did it take 18 years <laughs> Well, it was, <laughs> it was kind of Constellation Reborn, right? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, pick your date. So I, I guess is it I, the question there is, is, is what we're seeing always been the case and that mm. that that the story of Apollo is a special case because of the circumstances yeah, or, yeah. or 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 is there a sea change now, with, you know, with this this new kind of private public NASA uh, commercial partnership that that could change all of that? Yeah, no, I know. I, I think the situation really hasn't fundamentally changed, regardless of who's building the rockets. Um, and new space, old space, and I always, I ask everybody I talk to, what, what is new space as opposed to old space? And the answers range across the board, and some of them don't necessarily hold a lot of water, but that's beside the point. Um, 
the the reality is our political system is built upon two, four, and six year time frames. And uh, and if you're a member of Congress, you're only looking out two years. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's a max. Yeah. Um, you you may have an agenda that that you'd like to go farther than that, and that's that's great. But if you're not reelected, that doesn't matter. And uh, and so you have to start from ground zero every two years, four years for a president, six years for a senator. And uh, and consequently, unless those are all working in sync, it doesn't happen. It's only when we've got a, a, a major agenda item that pushes everybody into this in this direction, in my mind. Um, and, you know, the reality today is NASA is not going to get a lot more money. Yeah. I mean, it's just not. It's going to bump along about where it's been. And, and if we can go back to the moon on that budget, everyone will cheer. <laughs> but if we can't do that, then we're not going to go. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and we've had some successes of late and greater successes than I think a lot of people thought were going to take place with the rise of, of SpaceX and, the, and, the, and that launch system, as well as the one from What's its name now? It used to be, it used to be Orbital Sciences, and it was Orbital ATK, and now it's something else. Northrop Grumman Space Systems. <laughs> there it is. There it is. And 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 having those those systems in place has been a real boon for supporting uh, Earth orbital activities. And those same sort of companies and others like them may be able to bounce beyond or Earth orbit and go other places as well. But we've not seen a lot of demonstration of that yet. Mm -hmm. And, um, and once we do, once again, I'll cheer, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I'm going to be circumspect until I see some some capability there. Well, I, I just want to <clears throat> say for just in case Mr. Musk and Mr. Bezos are listening, if you took <laughs> some of your, your catering money from your next party, you could probably have my condo on Pluto in about six years. So <laughs> please feel free to, to take over budgeting the American space effort. Uh, we're going to go to a break and we'll be right back. Stay with us. Okay, I'm grabbing the next question. Nah, nah. Um, <laughs> So we, we, you kind of touched on this, but, you know, we have a so NASA is doing business in a new way. Cost plus contracts, hopefully, are a thing of the past, although SLS soldiers on. Um, I don't know. Was the uh, the what do they call it? There's an ongoing contract for support and building of more SLS rockets. Was that finally completed cost plus or fixed fee? I don't remember. You know, I don't I don't have that offhand either. Yeah, I know it was part of the conversation. But, you know, we are in a new space age. We've got these, these, the Billionaires Boys Club, which has been great, frankly. I mean, when you look at last year, Tark and I were talking about this the last couple of weeks. Uh, I forget what the actual number at the end of the year was, but when I was checking in, we had 105 launches in 2023 and 93 of them or something were SpaceX. <laughs> so that's a very telling story right there. I think they had 98 launches last year. 98, 98 96, okay. 96 orbital and then the two Starship flights. So this is doing business in a new way. Um, so uh, here's another one of those thorny multi-part questions. A, do we ever get another Kennedy moment of somebody standing up and, and saying, okay, here, here's my bold assertion because you know, we've, we've all heard the story about Mars. I remember about 2012, I think it was that graphic came out from NASA of the big Mars tentacle that went from, <laughs> from earth to Mars, like a squid. And I, and I, I actually, I was teaching university at that point. One of my students asked me when it was we landed people on Mars so long ago, because they had seen so many great computer graphics. They thought we had, we had done it. So I, so part one, do we get that bold assertion? And part two, um, is doing business in this new way going to make the difference? We all hope it will, or are we going to get our shoelaces cross tied again? Well, I'm putting you right out there. I apologize. Yeah. This is really skating <laughs> towards the thin ice. Yeah, well, I mean, my, my initial response is your guess is as good as mine. But, <laughs> um, but the reality is you have to ask yourself the question. When a president were to stand up and make a statement like Kennedy made, what would drive that decision? We know what drove Kennedy's decision. It was all about the Cold War. And absent that Cold War, he never would have done it. Right. 
Uh, we've had other presidents a couple of times now stand up and say back to the moon and on to Mars. And how well did that turn out? Um, so for somebody else to do that, you have to ask the question, what is the overarching political problem that they are seeking to solve? Because first and foremost, they want to solve a political problem. That's, that's what they're doing. Right. Uh, it's not that they think that, they may think it's a little cool, but uh, but they're not going to expend political capital on this unless they think there's some broader overarching concern. And I've, I've used Mars as an example of this repeatedly. Um, you know, what would it take to get a president to stand up and say, look, we need to begin an over, all overarching effort uh, to reach Mars by some date certain? And uh, and how well would that be responded to by other people who don't necessarily agree with them? And um, and what is the political trigger, the overarching concern that would drive that decision? What is it that would make a per make a president stand up and say, this is what we need to do? And I just don't see it. Mm -hmm. Somebody immediately said when I said that in a, in a public speech, uh, well, what if we found life on Mars? And I said, well, then maybe the best thing to do is to leave them alone. <laughs> Did they throw rocks? <laughs> <laughs> well, they might. <laughs> I, I got out of there. But anyway. <laughs> is, the, is the China argument, because uh, Bill Nelson, the NASA chief, mm -hmm. former senator, brought it up again this, uh, yeah. this week with the, uh, the Artemis delay announcement, you know, that that uh, the, the U.S. was still going to beat China to get uh, uh, astronauts back to the moon. Is that not, uh, maybe it's a, a more of a lukewarm driver than the Cold War was, but it's one that, that has been ramped up uh, in, in, in Nelson's kind of, uh, you know, session uh, leading, uh, leading NASA, as that is like a chief driver. He, he brings it up to Congress in almost every appearance uh, to remind them and, and whatnot, but it doesn't seem to have the same verve or, or zhuzh, right? That, uh, that, you know, the Soviets are coming to the moon, you know, had during the cold war. Yeah. Well, and, and you, you misphrased it. It was red moon. I think <laughs> that, that was the, the big shaking fist that, that, uh, Johnson used so effectively. Sorry, go ahead, Roger. Yeah, no, I, I mean, you, you know, the reality is we don't have a fear of the, of the Chinese the way we had a fear of the, the existential crisis with the Soviet Union. I mean, it's just not the same at all. Uh, yeah, there are things we disagree with them on. Um, there are things they, they do that we don't like one little bit. And, uh, but if they make it to the moon before we get back there, who really cares? Yeah. Uh, and there's probably polling on that, by the way, but I haven't seen it. <laughs> and, uh, I'll bet there is. And, Most people uh, probably go, huh? Yeah. And, uh, and, and beyond that, if we're talking about Mars, you know, is there a concern that the, that the Chinese are going to get there before us? I don't think so. Uh, mm -hmm. As I said, you know, there, there is some tensions between the United States and China, but it's nothing like the existential threat that we felt in the 1960s. I mean, when I was a kid in, in grammar school, we crawled under our desk and duck and cover exercises like that would protect us from a nuclear blast. I thought it was stupid when I was 10. Where, where did you grow up? I'm curious. <laughs> South Carolina. <laughs> so we did the same thing in, in Pasadena, Pat, California, uh -huh. where I grew okay. up. Yeah. And I remember as a kid thinking, okay, this is a half hour, a half inch of Formica. Yeah, it's supposed right. <laughs> to protect me through these big, huge windows from a 5,000 degree nuclear fireball. And then I grew up later, I was working on some History Channel documentary about the Cold War, and I actually saw a map, a Russian targeting map of Pasadena with three overlapping circles, one for Caltech, oh, yeah, yeah. one You're for to JPL, totally you were one on for the, the Weapon Center, list. and our school was right in the overlap point. And I thought, well, that would have been pretty quick, but duck, uh, yeah, that was and, a silly time. Duck and cover, Rod. Duck and cover. Yeah, sorry. Uh, you have another question, Tark. No, I, I just, I, I had a clarification. Rod, you asked about the SLS contracts uh, earlier, and just, I just, I, I did, um, I did confirm that last year, it, it's NASA finalized a 3.2 billion contract um, to do not just core stages for Artemis 3 and 4, but also to build the exploration upper stage for five and six. It's the same evolution 
of of the main contract, but it's it's operational now as opposed to you know all of the research. And what R&D. you're saying is it's still cost plus basis. Oh, that's that's what it looks like. So yeah. okay, but but I can tell you that NASA is watching a lot closely now <laughs> than than they were before. So well, well but I, and and they should. Uh, yeah. You know, one of the yeah. things that was very common during the Apollo era was uh, was people who were complaining about the budget, you know, they get responses from NASA, well, it's going to cost what it costs. And if you've got an overarching concern to get this done on a, on a time certain, uh, then you accept that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the sort of iron triangle of, of project management is cost schedule and reliability. And the, and the answer is pick two, because you can't have all three. <laughs> yeah. So can I ask an archivist question? Sure. Years ago, I was working on a show. Oh, it was um, the real right stuff, I think, for okay. Disney Net Geo. So I was over at uh, University of Houston across from JSC, where they have their archive now. And I was stunned to find like one person, an assistant that was in charge of the whole thing. And they're really nice and really helpful, but they kind of had this tired, used up look like, please don't ask us to find this specific thing. <laughs> so I went to the archive and it was like NASA had backed a, a cube van up and just, you know, gently, but just pushed out these boxes of stuff. Yeah. And so I was going through things that they hadn't even cataloged yet. And I was finding like uh, eight inch reel to reel tape boxes that were marked just John and Gus 61. It's like, well, what? Oh, John Glenn and Gus Grissom. So there, there's some real gems there. It makes one wonder, you know, what's in the archives at this point that we still don't necessarily know is there. But I guess my specific question is, um, you know, at the time they were racing to get to the moon. And I don't think when you and I were teenagers, all the people at NASA were thinking, we have to preserve this stuff for the historians 50 years hence. So when you're doing research for, in my case, a book or for you books or, or what have you, um, you find even a lot of primary references that disagree on stuff yeah. or are incomplete. What's your experience been? Well, oh, that's always the case. And there's tons of stuff in the archives that haven't been plowed by very many people at all. Uh, you know, occasionally you'll find something new and different that really kind of sets things in a different light, but mostly it confirms what you already know. So you don't necessarily think all that much about it. Hmm. Um, you know, that at University of Houston Clear Lake, where they've got the material there uh, from, from Johnson Space Center, uh, generally speaking, that's a decent repository, and they're trying to do the right thing in terms yeah. of maintaining it. Uh, they don't have a lot of capability to uh, to catalog it and make it available, and so they're doing the best they can. Uh, but that's better than what the National Archives does most of the time. Hmm. Uh, I mean, literally, when you go to one of these federal record centers, um, and, you know, the, the record center that supports the Southeast or Kennedy uh, Space Center and, and uh, Marshall Space Flight Center send their materials is just outside of, of Atlanta. And literally you will have thousands upon thousands of boxes and they'll just be labeled, you know, NASA, <laughs> whatever, NASA organizational materials or something like this. And you have no idea what's in those boxes. Now you can go look at them. Yeah. Um, but there's no finding aid. There's no nothing associated with this. And so you just literally pull the boxes out and go through them one at a time and find whatever's in there. It's a, it's a very slow process. And for those of us who uh, are sort of on a clock and trying to get things done, uh, it's hard to find that material, and you have to ask yourself the question, is it worthwhile going through all those boxes to find some gem someplace that you may not find for a month if, if you spend a month in that archive? And, well, um, and, and, and it's hard. Of, I mean, it's a hard thing to do. We're, we're both kind of at that point, at least I, I, I am in life, where I can start seeing that brick wall, you know? Yeah. It's like, okay, how much of the time I have left? And, I, again, I don't know your experience in this area, but... I, I had four books come out in 2019. A couple of them sold well. A couple kind of did what niche space books usually do. But I had two first look deals out of that and, and a bunch of very happy publishers. And I went back to them this year for a much cooler project. 
And the two first look places either went out of business or got acquired, and the rest of them were kind of, oh, space books, yeah. Um, mm, uh, and it suddenly has gotten a lot harder to do that. So on mm-hmm. top of, you know, the difficulty of finding the material, now it's this uphill struggle of just trying to get the word out if you actually, you know, want to earn anything for being an author, which yeah. is, I guess, a luxury now. It's hard to make a living as a solely as a freelance author. There's no doubt about that. And it's been that way for a while. Uh, and you know it better than I do. I mean, I always had a day job, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I had a, a quick follow about the, the challenge of being an archivist. And, you know, you were just talking about, you know, these, these, maybe these hidden, these hidden records, you know, that, that, that are just out there that no one has found yet or, or, or just open that yeah, box. Let, let, let's mark. rephrase it. They're not <laughs> hidden. Nobody's hiding them. No. It's just <laughs> Un, undiscovered, undiscovered. Yeah, nice nice undiscovered, conspiracy right? shot, Tarek. Yeah. Nice try. No, 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 no. But it just, it gets me thinking about, uh, you know, when I first started my career in order to get video for space.com, we would have to write to Johnson and get, uh, uh, Johnson Space Center and, and get, you know, approvals. And then the beta tapes would arrive uh, for every flight day's highlights. And then I'd have to send them back at the end. Uh, and and now, you know, 20 some odd years later, uh, you have astronauts sending photos and, and, and reports, you know, on Twitter, but also on Instagram, but also through TikToks. And you have all these different formats of information telling one small piece of the story that is space exploration, not just NASA and astronauts, but also uh, companies themselves and, and, and the scientists that are releasing studies uh, through different ways. And it just seems to me that the job of being a, a space historian 30 years from now, looking back at this, is going to be so much more difficult to try to piece all of those different things together because they're all in different places and in different formats on an internet that may change entirely in the next 20 years. Um, yeah, but he and I aren't going to be here. Well, I'm just, but this I'm, is your I'm just, problem. I, is there, is there an event horizon, I guess, about what, what we will be able to preserve from this digital age of space chronicling that is out there that we have to worry about? This is one of the biggest topics in archival in the archival world. It's not just about NASA; it's about everything. And um, in, in the context of NASA, there is a, a an organization that uh, made up of volunteers uh, called to boldly preserve <laughs> uh, about trying to capture uh, information about these various entities that are engaged in space activities. Uh, and we're concerned about this in a lot of settings, but one of the biggest ones is in the corporate world. Mm-hmm. Uh, no one guards their materials more um, more carefully than corporations. And it doesn't matter what corporation we're talking about. Uh, I had on my advisory committee in the 1990s at NASA for the history program, the general counsel for Rockwell International before they got bought out by Boeing. And uh, and he, he he said, look, personally, I love what you guys are doing, but I treat every document like a ticking time bomb. <laughs> you know, what is going to be in there that we're going to have to go to court over at some point? <laughs> so I don't want anybody to see anything. Wow. And, uh, and, and he was being honest, I think, in the way in which a lot of, of, uh, of uh, general counsels and corporations look at documents. So uh, how do we preserve those? You know, NASA is great because they – you know, they work through the Federal Records Act, and uh, and while it's hard to find stuff, at least it's there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you want to spend enough time, you can find it. And, of course, they require their contractors to put in reports pretty regularly about what they're doing and why they're doing it. And, and so that's all fine. So that makes it easier. Uh, so the corporate piece of this has is is been hard all along. It remains mm-hmm. hard. Uh, the... The other part of this, which is everybody's now their own archivist because they're creating their own materials and putting it out on the internet or on, on name the name name the web Pinterest, thing of your Kevin choice at this point. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff uh, that that's out there, and and you know they become they're they're 
they're curating their own sites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and whether or not that's going to be captured in any real way over time is anybody's guess. But we, we, we've had these debates all along. One of the things that happened in the first part of the 20th century when the telephone became ubiquitous, all the historians and the archivists were running around thinking, we're going to lose all of our records because there's no <laughs> record of a telephone call unless somebody mm -hmm. actually takes a, does a memo about it. And that's sort of kind of true, but not really. Yeah. Uh, so let's not overblow the, the crisis, <laughs> but let's be mindful that there can be a problem. Mm -hmm. in, in 2009, 2010, I was teaching at an executive, it was the uh, Apollo Executive Learning Experience or something at Johnson Space Center with a delightful lady named Jeannie Engel, who was at the time, she was getting ready for retirement in a few years, but at the time she was the Chief Knowledge Retention Officer, I think was the title. And, you know, talking to her about that job and the task of that tiny department I just thought, my God, this feels hopeless, you know, and, and we've all been involved in sort of noble, probably hopeless deeds in our lives. But that one was big. And then a few years later, maybe it was a few years prior, they were shutting down uh, North American Rockwell and Downey, where they now have that little Columbia Memorial Museum mm -hmm. and just tossing tons of paperwork from the shuttle era. And you're standing there watching these forklifts put stuff into these 40 foot dumpsters wanting to scream, but I, I don't have a place to put it and neither do they, you know? So <laughs> at a certain point, I guess you just have to learn to let go of these things. But that's a, a down note on an up note. I have a completely unfair question to ask you for our clothes. When do we see boots on Mars? <laughs> 2033, right? 30 years. <laughs> you know, my time horizon is a little longer than that. Um, it is possible we might see somebody land on Mars in the, in the 2030s. I, it's, it's conceivable. Uh, I think on the outside, we'll see it by 2050, in which case I probably won't be here to see it. But uh, I would like to, I mean, there, there are two things I'd love to see happen before I'm gone. And I'm 69 years old now, so Another 10 years, another 15 years, about probably what I've got. Yeah. Um, the, um, I'd like to see, I'd like to see boots on the ground on moon again. I think I will. I think that's going to happen. I, 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 there's no reason to believe it, it won't. And certainly it can. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd like to see us on Mars as well. Uh, something that I have not seen yet. I saw the first time around on the moon. I want to see the next one. Well, well I'll, I'll pass the collection dish around and maybe we can get our, our brains stuck in jars with a couple of eyeballs on top side by side <laughs> somewhere in front of a TV screen and wait for the next Walter Cronkite to come along and say, and there they are, boots on Mars. Roger, thank you so much for coming today. I got through about half my questions. Okay. So well, maybe if we're lucky, we can drag you back for another episode at some absolutely, point. Absolutely. Anytime. I uh, really appreciate you coming to talk to us about why we go to space and who thinks we should and possibly shouldn't. Um, is there a place online where we could sort of track uh, your future developments and writings and so forth? Well, I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn. You can, you can look at me on there if you like. There's, I, I put a lot of things that are a little older on academia.edu, mm -hmm. but I don't have a web presence other than that. I used to keep a blog, but I sort of gave that up. Uh, I think it's still out there. I mean, you can look at it, but I haven't added anything to it in almost 10 years. So it's a little bit dated. It's archived. So well, you're yeah, a historian, right. so it's, that's it's, okay. It's, yeah. All right, Tarek, where can we keep an eye on your bright rising star, Cough Cough? Well, <laughs> as always, you can find me at uh, space.com, uh, also on the Twitter at Tarek J. Malik. And uh, this weekend, I guess we're going to be watching um, what happens with the rest of the uh, the Peregrine Moonlander mission. It's got, uh, mm. as we're recording this, yeah, it's got two days of fuel left, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and that leak uh, gets get, keeps getting better. Like they're, it's, it's getting sm smaller and smaller. So uh, we'll see. We'll see how far they can go. Fingers crossed. Oh, great. And of course, you can always find me at pilebooks.com and at astromagazine.com. Please don't forget to drop us a line at twist at twit.tv. That's T-W-I-S at twit.tv. We welcome your comments, suggestions, and ideas. And you know this already because I say this every week. Uh, and we do answer our emails. Well, I do. I, I have to like kick Tarek every now and then to answer a couple. But I will <laughs> oh, answer. He kicks hard, too. 
because we love you. Don't forget to check out space.com, the websites and the name, and the National Space Society at nss.org. Both are good places to satisfy your space, space flight cravings. New episodes of this podcast publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher, so make sure to subscribe, tell your friends, and give us reviews. Give us reviews. Give us reviews. That They tell you in, in advertising when I was working there, say everything three times. Give us reviews. I'll say it fourth. <laughs> also head to our website at twit.tv slash TWIS. Don't forget, you can get all the great programming on the Twit Network ad-free on Club Twit, as well as some extras that are only available there for $7 a month. You also support Twit programming, which needs that support desperately, please. So do join Club Twit. We all have. It's a good thing. And you can follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on Twitter and on Facebook and Twit.tv on Instagram. <gasps> Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.